true or false. It is possible for a person to be a Christian, a born-again child of God, and to be heaven-bound and not have assurance of their salvation. True or false? The answer, of course, is true. It is possible to be a Christian and not have the assurance of your salvation. And there are a number of reasons why many Christians do not have the assurance of their salvation. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the Apostle John says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know that you have eternal life. The entire epistle of 1 John contains about a dozen tests of a saving faith. So a Christian not having assurance of their salvation can test their faith according to the first epistle of John and they can emerge from those tests with the assurance of their salvation. I believe God wants His children to have assurance of their salvation and the joy of their salvation that comes with that assurance. Last week, I brought a message, Why the Saved Can Never Perish. In that message, we set forth the foundation upon which your eternal security rests as a child of God, and therefore the foundation for your assurance of your salvation. Second question, true or false? It is possible for a person to be lost alienated from God and have assurance that they are heaven-bound and yet they will perish forever. True or false? The answer to this question is true. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We see that this statement is absolutely true. Now, last Sunday, we sought to help you to gain assurance of your salvation as a Christian. Some of you will leave here this morning thinking, boy, last Sunday was wonderful as the pastor tried to help me gain assurance of salvation, but then today, he just tried to yank it away from me. No, 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 that's not what I'm trying to do. But you have to understand the message this morning is a companion message to the message last Sunday morning. They need to be heard back to back to gain the biblical balance. For just as surely as last Sunday's message declared that there is a legitimate assurance of salvation according to the Word of God, the message this morning also declares that there is a counterfeit assurance of salvation which Satan promotes in order to keep lost people lost so that He can take as many of them with Him into the eternal lake of fire. This morning I want to address the issue when assurance of salvation can lead you to hell. We turn to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 21. This is, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Thank you. You may be seated. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, in this brief passage, the Lord Jesus Christ issues a stern warning. Every person claiming Jesus as Lord would be wise to very carefully consider. In this brief passage, the Lord Jesus Christ sets forth the severity of the problem of assurance of salvation. He sets forth the scope of the problem, and then He sets forth the solution of the problem. 
So first of all, let's look at the severity of the problem of assurance of salvation. Jesus warns that those with assurance of salvation can perish in the lake of fire. Notice verse 23, please. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that there are people who possess an absolute conviction and confidence that they belong in the kingdom of heaven, that they deserve to go to heaven. And yet, they're going to end up in hell. Now, how severe a problem do you think that is? On a scale of 1 to 10, I would say because this problem has eternal consequences, a problem cannot get any more severe than this problem. Would you agree? I'd put it on a 10 on the level of severity. This is a very severe problem. Now, notice the context of Jesus' words in verse 22. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Notice the context of these words. The event to which Jesus is referring takes place on that day. Those of you who are students of the Gospels understand that when Jesus refers to that day, oftentimes He is referring to the day of judgment as He is doing so here. And I would refer you to Matthew 24, verse 36, another occasion where He refers to that day as being the day of judgment. So the context for Jesus' words here is the context of the day of judgment. It is the day of reckoning in which Jesus says to these individuals, Depart from me, I never knew you. I would also point out, in this brief passage, there is not even the slightest glimmer of a hint that Jesus gives any of these individuals a second chance. This is the day of reckoning. This is the day of judgment. This is the day when all of their earthly choices have come to fruition. And they are being held to account concerning the choices of their lifetime. Jesus doesn't say, depart from me unless you repent. He simply says, depart from me. I never knew you. Folks, those must be the saddest words in all the Bible. Jesus does not give them a second chance to repent. Jesus is being very consistent with the rest of the Bible. But folks, the Bible does not give any hint or clue or encouragement at all that there is any such thing as a second chance after death. In issuing this warning here in Matthew 7, the Lord Jesus is giving His hearers in His day and His hearers in our day a second chance. And because you and I don't have any guarantee of one more hour, much less even one more day of life on the earth, this may not only be His second warning to you, it may also be His final warning to any one of us. I would like to point out the source of the false assurance that these people are saved and belong in heaven. This false sense of security is based upon three things according to the words of Jesus. These believe they are going to heaven because, number one, they possess kingdom knowledge. Notice they say in verse 21, Lord, Lord, they have kingdom knowledge. These people know who Jesus is. They know He is Lord of lords and King of kings. I don't know how they came to that knowledge. They may have been raised in a church. They may have gleaned this knowledge from Sunday school teachers, youth workers, vacation Bible school teachers, from the pastor as he declared the Word of God week after week. 
They may have gained this knowledge through listening to Christian radio. They may have watched or listened to Dr. Billy Graham on the radio or television. And they may have come to this knowledge of who Jesus is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world, who gave His life as an atoning sacrifice to pay for the sins of all mankind. And think because they have kingdom knowledge that they belong in the kingdom. There's just one major problem here. Their knowledge is purely intellectual. It has not brought any transformation in their hearts or in their lives. Intellectual knowledge of Jesus, His identity and His mission on the earth has never saved a single wretched soul. How do I know that? Because the Bible says over in the book of James, you believe God is one, you do well, but the demons believe as much and tremble. And folks, they're lost. Intellectual knowledge may be a step toward experiencing God's love and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, but intellectual knowledge alone has never, ever been able to save a single lost soul. And these believe, because they know who Jesus is, they belong in His kingdom. These also believe that they are going to heaven and have that sense of assurance Secondly, because they know kingdom language. Notice in verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These people know the language of the kingdom, don't they? I bet they could even say hallelujah every now and then. Maybe even say amen in church. Notice they refer to the name. Lord, Lord, the name. Did not we do many things in Your name? They also knew the kingdom language of the Word of God. They said, did we not prophesy? They understood that. They said, hey, didn't we cast out demons? They knew the terminology of spiritual warfare. And they said, did we not in Your name see many wonders? They knew the terminology of miraculous supernatural occurrences within the kingdom. They must have been very serious students of the Christian faith to have this kind of knowledge, but there's a major problem. Though they had knowledge of the kingdom and knew the language of the kingdom, all of this had remained a religion and had never become a personal, life-transforming love relationship with the king of the kingdom. In fact, Jesus in the parable of the soils talks about a soil in which the seed of the gospel sprouted forth with joy. And yet, they never produced fruit of a saving experience with Jesus Christ and they perished forever. Just because you know the language of the kingdom does not mean that you are a born-again child of the living God. Third, these possess assurance that they belong in the kingdom, a false assurance to be sure, because these recognize kingdom power. Notice in verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Your name, cast out demons in Your name, and done many wonders in Your name? These people had seen, and in some sense, they had experienced the supernatural dimension of the Word of God. They had seen the power of prophetic preaching and its power to impact and transform the lives of those who receive it. They had seen the supernatural power of spiritual warfare as demons had been bound in the name of Jesus and cast out and souls had been liberated. These had seen the supernatural power of miracles in the kingdom of God. That's what wonders means. It means signs and miracles. And they had seen these things. But I want to point out, they did not witness these supernatural manifestations of the kingdom of God because of any faith on their own part. They witnessed the supernatural expressions of God's kingdom because of the power and authority of the name of Jesus. Do you know there are several accounts, one in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 38, where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Master, Master, there's a man over there doing mighty works in your name and he doesn't follow with us. Do you want us to go and rebuke him? And Jesus says, No. He'll not long see the authority of the power of my name and speak ill against me. 
Now, there's a person who is not a believer, but he was somehow experiencing the supernatural authority and power of the name of Jesus. And I believe Jesus had the hope that if that man came to see and recognize and even understand in a small way the authority and power of the name of Jesus, he might repent of his sins and call upon that glorious name for the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation of his soul. Folks, there's power and authority in the name of Jesus. And these to whom Jesus is speaking knew the power of the kingdom of heaven. And because of this, they sensed that they ought to go to heaven. They sensed that they had a right to be a part of the kingdom of God. And yet, in spite of the fact that they had seen the power of God and that power had been at work in their lives, that power apparently had never had any transforming power in their hearts. This knowledge of the kingdom, this language of the kingdom that they had mastered, this recognition of the power of the kingdom of God had become for these a counterfeit conversion and a substitute for genuine faith that will repent of sin and surrender in obedience to the Lordship of Jesus. It was a false assurance of salvation. Well, someone might say, wow, that's pretty serious. You're right. That's a very severe problem. But surely, Pastor, that doesn't happen very often. Certainly, people in the church would not fall prey to this deception and false assurance of salvation. Folks, Jesus identifies the scope of this problem. Notice, if you would, Jesus warns that many with assurance of salvation will perish in the lake of fire. Notice in verse 22, He says, Many will say to Me in that day, Lord, Lord, verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That word many troubles me greatly. That word many drives me to want to declare this message from the mountaintops. I don't know how many many is, but I suspect the word many encompasses a number somewhere between tragic and epidemic in proportion. I do believe that word many encompasses Baptists. I do believe that word many encompasses Presbyterians and Methodists and Pentecostals and Assembly of God and Catholic. I believe that word many ought to be unsettling in anybody's heart who claims Jesus as Lord, lest we fall prey to the deception of a counterfeit assurance of salvation and be a part of that ignominious number. Their assurance is false. It is a deception of their own mind. The fault is their own. Satan, to be sure, may be a part of perpetrating this counterfeit assurance, but Jesus does not lay this issue at the feet of Satan. He lays it at the feet of those who cry out to Him in that day, Lord, Lord, because they are responsible for the choices they have made in this world life, and they will not be absolved of their culpability by pleading the deceptions of Satan. The scope of this problem, folks, is horrific. Dr. Billy Graham, understanding this simple truth, said the greatest mission field in the world is the pews of the churches around the world people who have a sense of assurance of salvation, who if you ask them, are you going to go to heaven? They would say, yes, Lord, Lord, I know I'm going. And yet, if something does not change, they will perish forever. Jesus, thank God, gives us the solution to this problem. Jesus warns that salvation and the assurance of that salvation come only through a faith that surrenders to His Lordship. Notice, please, verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
the key word to understanding where Jesus is coming from and why He will cast these people into the eternal lake of fire is that word lawlessness. It is critically important to understanding the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ with which He will judge all of these who claim to know Him as Lord. The word lawless is the opposite of divine lordship. Look just back in verse 21. Jesus has already set the context in which we are to understand the word lawlessness. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. These whom Jesus calls workers or practitioners of lawlessness are not those who do the will of His Father in heaven. Just the opposite of it. They are workers of lawlessness. They are not living in obedience to the will of the Father. I want you to keep a finger here in Matthew chapter 7 and turn with me please over to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. I think the Apostle John may have been having his quiet time and he may have been having it in the Sermon on the Mount because I'm telling you he gives us a great commentary on the passage 1 John 3 verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He, referring to Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. Now according to John, what is sin? What is a synonym for the word sin according to verse 4? Lawlessness. So if lawlessness is a synonym for sin, let's substitute lawlessness wherever the word sin shows up. Verse 5, And you know that He, Jesus, was manifested to take away our lawlessness. And in Him there is no lawlessness. Whoever abides in Him does not practice lawlessness. Whoever practices lawlessness has neither seen Him nor known Him. Now, does that make sense? Back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Depart from Me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, I don't know of any word that would better describe someone's heart, someone's nature, and someone's lifestyle than the word practice. Because what you practice is what you get good at. Isn't that true? Yeah, Bud Lewis practices golf, and he's pretty good at it. I practiced golf before our last Cana golf tournament, and I never did get good at it. Golfing's not in my heart. Golfing is in Bud Lewis's heart. Whatever is in your heart is what you pursue, and it is through practice that you gain proficiency in whatever your pursuit is. Jesus says these have practiced lawlessness, and lawlessness is sin. This reveals the nature of their hearts. Their hearts and their fallen nature, their wills were a law in and of themselves. Their hearts were a law unto themselves. They were not committed to, nor were they practicing doing the will of Jesus' Father in heaven. Do you see that? It is critically important that you see that. And because these, by their very heart and lifestyle, were practicing lawlessness, rebellion against the will of the Father and the Lordship of Jesus, they could cry out, Lord, Lord, and it had no meaning. They did not know Jesus as Lord. They had never surrendered their wills to Him as Lord. They had never repented of their sins and surrendered to Jesus as Lord. They were a law in and unto themselves. And that is why Jesus could characterize them as those who practice lawlessness. And because they never knew Jesus, Jesus could say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me forever. These people had an assurance of salvation. They believed they belong in the kingdom, and yet they perished forever. 
Many of you have knowledge of the kingdom, are proficient in talking the language of the church and of the Christian faith. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I just wonder how many of you, myself included, have ever cast out demons and seen them routed by the authority of Jesus' name. I wonder how many of us could claim that we have seen that supernatural manifestation of the kingdom. I wonder how many of us could say we in the name of Jesus had seen great miracles and signs and wonders take place in our presence. I'm telling you, these people thought they were heaven bound. If they, with their kind of reasoning, had a counterfeit assurance, I wonder how many today are also Christians in name only, claiming Jesus as Lord, claiming the title of Christian. But if nothing changes, they will perish forever. Jesus says, I never knew you. You do not belong in my kingdom. Keep a finger there and turn over to Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 and 42. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. What Jesus is saying here is that there are those like these in Matthew 7 who believe they're supposed to be in the kingdom, And Jesus says, their day will come when I will send out my angels and separate them from my people because they are workers of lawlessness and that is contrary to my kingdom. Lordship is a lot more than religious talk. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Folks, that just defines lordship very, very succinctly. Lordship involves a faith that both surrenders to and obeys the Lordship of Jesus, His will for our life. I'm not perfect and neither are you, but I'll tell you right now, in my heart of hearts, I want to honor the Lordship of Jesus Christ every day of my life. And when I stumble and when I fail, it's because I've chosen to stumble and fail. But I'll tell you what I do. My heart is grieved over my failings. I repent. I claim His forgiveness. I surrender afresh to His Lordship. I get up, dust myself off, and we get back into the battle. It is my nature to want to honor His Lordship. And for every born-again child of God, you have the nature of God. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, He not only gives you the nature of God, but job priority number one is to teach you and me how to live and walk under the Lordship of Jesus. Because that is where the victory is in the Christian life. That is where the power of the Holy Spirit is made manifest in our lives, is under the Lordship of Jesus. Doing the will of our Heavenly Father and honoring His purpose for our lives. Adam rebelled against God's lordship in his life in the Garden of Eden, and he plunged himself and all of his descendants, including you and me, into the kingdom of darkness. In order for you and me to get out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God, we have to reverse the Adamic rebellion against God, and we reverse the Adamic rebellion against God by faith, repenting of our rebellion against God and surrendering to Jesus as our Lord and Savior and invite Him to come and sit on the throne of our hearts. It's that simple and it is that critical. No one ever got into the kingdom of God who did not by faith repent of self-lordship and surrender the throne of their hearts to Jesus' lordship. And then to drive this point home, in verse 24 of Matthew 7, Jesus tells the parable of two builders, the wise builder and the foolish builder. He's just said, doing the will of my Father in heaven is critically important. It's what a saving faith does. Then he goes on and says that a wise person is that person and only that person who is willing to surrender to and obey the words of Jesus so as to build their life and their eternity on the solid rock of the Word of God. 
Those who claim to be religious, those who claim Jesus as Lord and refuse to submit in obedience to the Word and will of Jesus as revealed in the Scriptures, not only are they not wise, but they're also very foolish. And they will perish forever because of their folly. There is no wisdom in an intellectual relationship with Jesus Christ. Wisdom must submit by faith to the Lordship and will of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I must ask this question, because I believe Jesus is asking this question. Is your assurance of salvation going to take you to hell? To resolve any question regarding the status of your assurance of salvation, whether it is counterfeit or genuine, you must, as an expression of your faith, choose to surrender your heart, your will, and your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you are saved and a child of God, you don't have any problem whatsoever praying the prayer I'm going to pray in just a moment. Surrendering your heart afresh and anew to Jesus as Lord. If you today do not know for sure and certain that Jesus is the sovereign Lord of your heart, the saving Lord of your life, then I suggest and strongly urge you to pray the following prayer with me. You can pray it in your heart. I'll pray it aloud. Let's pray together, please. Lord Jesus, I need You. I desire that You be the sovereign Lord of my heart and life. Today, I bend the knee to You. Today, I own no other Master. Today, my heart shall be your throne. Jesus, I put no confidence in my works, in my knowledge, or in my experiences for the assurance of my salvation. I put my confidence in your saving grace and your Lordship in my life. I invite you to make changes in my life so as to manifest Your Lordship in my relationships, in my work, in my family, in my church, in my community. You, Lord, are Lord. Lord Jesus, You are giving someone here a second chance today to abandon counterfeit assurance and to embrace the real thing by embracing You as Lord and Savior. For someone here today, Lord, this may be their last opportunity to make this decision before stepping into eternity. We pray that they will hear Your voice in their hearts. We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.